Watching the world burn, watching the world burn, June 7th, 2024. And I'm going to tell you what, me and the dog are burning up, man. This is one of the hottest days I've ever been out in Florida. But I want you to see this over here. Check him out, man. By the way, I saved a turtle. I didn't realize if they flip over on their back, well, the turtle that I think I saved, they can't get back up. Let's, let's get the camera down on him. Oh, there we go. Uh, let me get my shadow off. Uh, I hate messing with the little guy. There was another turtle right up here. Anyway, we're going to get into the video here in just a minute. I got to get him watered. And then we're going to talk about the world burning. All right. Let's get into the first story. Uh, O'Reilly came on the uh, Glenn Beck Show. And he says that uh, Obama and Klein, those are the two people that head up the uh, Democrat Party, uh, are there sequestered with the Bidens at uh, Camp David. And uh, he's got it from his sources that uh, they're laying down the law that Biden's got to go. So if that's the case, uh, which, you know, Obama, he hits that whole thing up anyway. Um, so it looks like Biden's out. So I guess the question then becomes is who are they going to run? You know, the thing is, I... I I, you know, we know Newsom and Whitmer. The thing I don't understand is, you know, Whitmer, I, Democrats like being punished, you know. They love being punished. So Whitmer would probably be the best because what she did to Michigan during the COVID nightmare, I mean, she locked them down. It was unbelievable. The kids couldn't go to school for the longest time. And then the Michiganders, uh, they loved that. They loved being locked down. They loved being whipped. And the, when she destroyed the car industry, so, you know, and that Democrats love that. So I'm thinking that Whitmer's might be the best choice because she'll inflict the most pain on the Democrats. But, because uh, they voted her back in. I mean, uh, Tudor, Tudor was a real good candidate and the Democrats voted for Whitmer. Now, how much of that were votes and how many of them were illegal ballots? Because I know that, you know, the way the Democrat Party runs Michigan, because I used to live there, I'm sure there were a lot of Illicit activity, let's just say, in Detroit and around Wayne County for sure. I think most of the rest of the state does a pretty good job of being honest. Maybe not Lansing per se, but, you know, most Wayne County pretty much elects, elected Whitmer because there's so much illegal, illegal ballots that go in there. It's hard to overcome that, and I think that's what put Tudor out. So I can't say that Michigan actually voted for Whitmer, but, uh, but you know, the, the thing is, all those Democrats who participate in, you know, in rigging the election, you know, they got a, they got a huge machine there. All right, so, you know, you know Newsom. A lot of people are saying they're being real tight-lipped about Michelle Obama. I guess we'll see. So the next story I wanted to get to was, I, I want you to, I was going to put together, I had a bunch of uh, ex-posts that I was going to post up because what we've got for leadership in Europe, there's a bunch of lunatics, man. <laughs> if you think NATO is a defensive alliance, think again, man. You know, my last video I did, Viktor Orban was over in uh, in Russia. You know, well, first he visited Ukraine, and uh, Zelensky told him to take a hike, and no way they wanted peace with Russia. So then Orban went to to Russia, got a real good reception. I showed you that in the last video. Him and Putin, they actually talked for like three hours. And uh, so I'm going to get the uh, the first clip up. So this was Orban on the plane on his way back. I think he's on his way back to Hungary. And this is what he had to say about the meeting. None of that is true. The, Russia has no interest in going to the West. Uh, and you don't have to take anybody's word for it. You don't have to trust them because they don't have the military capacity to do so. But Viktor Orban <coughs> gave a gave a, an interview to a, a reporter. I, I think he was on his plane ride back from Moscow when they were asking him, you know, point blank, why are you talking to Vladimir Putin and can he be trusted? Here's what he had to say. Is a uh, 100 more than 100 percent a rational person? When he negotiates, when he start to explain a point, when he makes a proposal, saying yes or no, he's super super rational. How how to say in Hungarian? Cool-blooded, you know, cool-blooded. 
low profile cool body, you know, very cautious, punctually formation, you know, discipline. So, so it's, a, it, it's a real challenge to have a negotiation and to be prepared if you would like to, to keep the intellectual and political level of him. So in his view, he's a tough negotiator, but he's rational. So he can be dealt with on the facts. And the facts that uh, uh, Viktor Orban operates from, he views, are also very calculated and also very rational. Now, he laid out very clearly in, uh, I think it was December of 2023, uh, why he holds the position that we need to have a negotiated settlement because this war cannot be won by the West. I really think there is no chance of Ukraine winning. That's and my surely point. the main, surely the main. They stand very little chance of winning without the aid which you are currently blocking. No, no, my, my, my position is that uh, looking at the reality, looking at the figures, looking at the surroundings, looking at the fact that NATO is not ready to send troops, it's obvious that there is no victory for uh, Ukra poor Ukrainians on the battlefield. That's, that's my position. And that is definitely not the position of NATO. NATO has, has wed themselves, welded themselves, probably is a better way to put it, to the fact that Ukraine has to win and that Russia has to lose. The problem is, as Viktor Orban rationally and logically laid out, you cannot accomplish that objective. It's great that you want Ukraine to win and that you want Russia to lose. Everybody can have whatever opinion and desire that they want, but it matters a lot what you can and cannot accomplish. And NATO seems to be divorced from that reality. Okay, so that's, that's that clip. But then, you know, I was going to show you how all the NATO leaders are lunatics and how NATO doesn't want peace. So NATO is not a peaceful organization. They are a war-mongering organization and that's why Putin went into Ukraine because he knew sooner or later NATO was going to wage war on Russia and they did big time through their proxy in Ukraine man Ukraine was armed to the T by the way I I hear word that uh, we've we've run out of weapons to send to Ukraine for the most part so I'm not sure how many more weapons Ukraine has I think it's going to come down not to the fact that they, they, don't want, they don't mind killing 2,000 of their soldiers a day. That's what the Russians are killing about every day. 2,000 or more. I mean, that's, that's just cannon fodder right there. I mean, just that alone would, would mean that you should declare or at least sue for peace or talk to, talk to Putin. But uh, anyway, they don't care about that. But I wanted to show you, the, the, I wasn't going to show you this whole video because it's like six minutes long. And I, I don't like borrowing, you know, a bunch of material from another news network but this was on RT and I thought this summarized the lunatics that are in charge of NATO better than anything that I could put together with a bunch of clips from X. Let's watch that whole video now. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban's surprise visit to Moscow this week should have been heralded as a major breakthrough in his meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin saw the pair discuss a potential ceasefire and an end to a conflict that has lasted around a decade. Both said that dialogue remained the only route to peace. We in Europe have been living in the shadow of war for two and a half years now. We do not feel safe, and this war has factored into a breakdown of economic development. The first important step has been made in terms of establishing dialogue, and I will continue this work. Ukraine's sponsors continue to use this country and its people as a battering ram or sacrifice for confrontation with Russia. As we see it, there is still an unwillingness in Kiev to abandon the idea of waging war to the bitter end. Nevertheless, we are grateful to the Prime Minister. We see this as an attempt to restore dialogue. But instead of welcoming Orban's peace mission, which also included a prior visit to Kiev for a meeting with Vladimir Zelensky, the Western sponsors of the proxy war in Ukraine went into a collective meltdown. Appeasement will not stop Putin. Only unity and determination will pave the path to a comprehensive, just and a lasting peace in Ukraine. 
Prime Minister Orban has not received any mandate from the EU Council to visit Moscow. In Moscow, Viktor Orban in no way represents the EU or the EU's positions. He is exploiting the EU presidency position to sow confusion. It is a scandal that Orban is shamefully abusing the EU Council presidency and traveling to Kremlin without a mandate. Either the Hungarian government respects its current role in the EU or it should resign as chair. Viktor Orban visits Putin as Hungarian prime minister. The EU's position is very clear. We condemn the Russian war of aggression. For all their so-called peace conferences and grandstanding over Russian aggression, it seems that Ukraine's Western backers prefer war-war over jaw-jaw. The EU insists that peace talks cannot be held without Ukraine. Of course, this is said without a hint of irony. Russia was not even invited to the high-profile and disastrous so-called peace conference in Switzerland last month. So the logic is that peace discussions can't be held without Ukraine, but they can be held without Russia. Sounds the definition of hypocrisy. Zelensky himself has introduced legislation banning Ukraine from entering peace talks with Russia, while NATO chief Jens Stoltenberg says Orbán's call for peace was not the position of the military alliance. Viktor Orbán is not representing NATO uh, at these uh, meetings. Uh, he is representing uh, his own country. When the fighting ends, uh, we need uh, uh, security. We need to enable the, uh, the Ukrainians to deter, but we also need some kind of security guarantees for Ukraine. And of course, that's also one of the reasons why Allies so clearly has stated that Ukraine will become a member of NATO. Washington, the biggest supplier of arms for Ukraine, also waded in, warning bizarrely that peace talks actually move the situation further away from peace. We are concerned that Prime Minister Orban would choose to make this trip to Moscow, which will not advance the cause of peace and is counterproductive to promoting Ukraine's uh, sovereignty, territorial integrity and independence. So it seems the mask has well and truly slipped. While Vladimir Putin has maintained all along that Russia remains open and committed to peace negotiations, Kiev and the West are doing all they can to prolong war. From scuppering a peace deal that would have seen a ceasefire back in 2022, to the seemingly never-ending flow of weapons while greenlighting attacks inside Russia, it seems the West is prepared to sacrifice thousands of Ukrainians for its own cause. But if not peace talks, then what? It is almost unprecedented to see a peace mission condemned so strongly. It's almost as if the West has another agenda. So, I want to continue on the theme that Democrats, well, they definitely want to punish you and me. <laughs> but, but they punish themselves most of all. I mean, when you look back on it, Trump was fully funding, I just want to go back in history just a little bit, he was fully funding the Keystone Pipeline, which would have kept energy costs down for all of us in the United States. Now the Keystone Pipeline, those were all union workers. And so they all voted for Biden. And what did Biden do on the first day when he came into office? He shut it all down. Every single one of those union workers lost their job because they voted for Biden. But you know what? They'll vote for Biden again. Even the unemployed ones. And it just blows my mind that Democrats punish themselves. Another example is the unions in, uh, in Detroit. They all voted for Biden, and they all lost their jobs. <laughs> so, so you see how people vote against their own self-interest? Blacks, blacks voted for Biden, and they all lost their jobs, but they'll vote Democrat again. I'm just saying, by the way, if you didn't, want, if you didn't see, that cybersecurity guy is on fire. The heat index, I found out, I was wondering what the heck was going on today. The heat index is 115 degrees. They're heading a breeze stern. And the humidity is about 100%. I'm dying out here, man. I'm dying. Good God, I can only make brief short clips now. Because I'm too damn tired to walk and do the video at the same time. So thank God I'm home. <laughs> I mean, that, that was one hot ass hike. I tell you what, you know, my ex-wife, uh, she says this dog can't handle the heat. Are you kidding me? I got home. He wanted to play with his toys. He's running around the house. And he wants a treat. Had to go pee. I mean, look at him. He's like a freaking champion. Anyway, she doesn't get him out and get him enough exercise. So we got two more big stories to talk about. 
right, now we've talked about the idiocy of the Western leaders. Uh, we've got three incredible leaders. You got Modi in India, of course, Putin in Russia, and Xi in China. All three of them are incredibly uh, intelligent. And well-educated uh, leaders. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that in the West. <laughs> We've got nothing but idiots, and I showed you that earlier in the video. But anyway, this uh, I you know I didn't even know, but India, well, they've been they've been buying uh, a lot of Russian oil and uh, a lot of uh, commodities and everything else from Russia, which is why the Russian economy is doing so good. And uh, I didn't even know this, but you probably don't either. But Modi's going to Russia. Let's let's watch a video on that right now. Moscow will receive a very special guest on Monday, the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Now there are many firsts in this visit. It's going to be Narendra Modi's first bilateral meet abroad since he was re-elected in June. It's also going to be his first visit to Russia after the war in Ukraine started and his first visit to the country in five years. Both sides aiming to boost the already thriving New Delhi-Moscow relationship to new heights. My, uh... Our relations with India are characterized in the fundamental bilateral documents as a particularly privileged strategic partnership. These are not just words. This formula reflects the truly special nature of our relations from India's independence to the present day. We highly appreciate the responsible stance taken by India, so worthy of a great power, in the international arena on all key issues on the global agenda. Remember, India has taken a neutral stance on the war despite Washington's request for India to condemn Moscow for the conflict. India puts its own sovereign interests first and we've seen India buy more and more discounted Russian crude despite Western pressures. There is no diplomatic or political environment. I think whoever has uh, produced this narrative don't know what they're talking about. The world is grateful to India for buying Russian oil. It's not that they don't want us to buy Russian oil. There may be price cap, there may be other restrictions. It's like this, if India, instead of buying Russian oil, if we start buying more of uh, the Middle Eastern oil, the oil price will not be at 75 or 76, it will be 150. But it's not just oil, it's a whole lot of other sectors. In fact, trade between India and Russia has increased many folds over the last couple of years. While India imports oil, wheat, fertilizers, metals, precious stones from Russia in reverse, Russia largely imports pharmaceuticals and telecom products from India. So that trade deficits exist and the two leaders when they meet, that definitely will be a priority talking point. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit to Russia is seen as another endorsement to the decades-long friendship between the two countries, which dates back to when the Soviet Union befriended India, which was just liberated from the British rule. Everyone conducts a relationship based on their past experiences. If I look at the history of India post-independence, Russia has never hurt our interests. The relations of power like Europe, the US, China or Japan with Russia, they have all seen ups and downs. We have had a stable and always very friendly relationship with Russia. And our relationship with Russia today is based on this experience. It's a visit that the world will be watching closely. And some, especially in the West, with a heavy heart. Okay, so that's, that's Modi going to Russia. So now you've got, I mean, India, what? They... What do they got? A billion people? <laughs> Maybe I don't. I don't. Know, it might be. And then you got China, which is like four billion people. And then you got Russia, which is kind of. The, I, I want to say it's bigger than the United States, but I don't know. I mean, we've got well with the illegal aliens adding thirty million more. I mean. Good God, I mean, I guess we're up to about 360, maybe 400 million now in the United States. Anyway, most of the world is lining up against the United States. I mean, it's it's crazy. I, we're only about 50, what did somebody quoted the West and the United States only amount to like 18% of the world population. I don't quote me on that. So we got the India deal going. And then a, the, the other big story that's not being reported on is Belarus. Belarus just joined the uh, Shanghai, uh, what is it called, a cooperation organization. Uh, that's a huge financial block. They also have uh, military ties. 
Uh, you probably didn't know. Uh, China has cozied up to Belarus as they've cozied up to Russia. Uh, and, and right now there's Chinese soldiers actually training alongside Belarus soldiers. So they're, they're solidifying their, uh, their military alliances. And then, of course, you know, as you know, Russia has been, they said they would expand horizontally or, or parallel or however you want to call it. Um, so, and by the way, it looks like Syria, uh, Putin met with Erdogan and uh, they're going to kick out the U.S. soldiers in Syria. So that'll be huge. So that base at least will be gone. I, I hope that it goes peacefully and that the, the soldiers there, the U.S. soldiers that are in Syria don't die. But uh, that means that, uh, so we're out, of, we're out of Syria, so that's good. Um, anyway, uh, let's just get into the news. I'll just start breaking these down. I, 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 you know, I haven't got, well, of course, at the end, we got to put on some Russian hardware. But anyway, Douglas McGregor, breaking bricks to launch independent financial system. We are leaving the dollar-dominated space and developing the mechanism and tools for, for a truly independent financial system. Morgulov also mentioned that the introduction of a new single currency is still a ways off, but emphasized that the group, now including Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, Ethiopia, Iran, and Egypt, is progressing in this direction. Now, if you didn't know, BRICS is trying to bring in uh, other nations very, very selectively. Uh, because it's a lot of work, man. When you're going to put together a whole new currency and, and, and take the world off the dollar... Uh, it's not an easy task, so they're trying to take it nice and slow and, and do it the right way. Uh, Wall Street Silver, it would be terrible if people were to dump massive amounts of water inside the ballot drop boxes in Democrat counties this election. <laughs> the reason why I like this, this X post was the Democrats are fighting like hell to keep the cameras off of the ballot boxes because they don't want cameras filming what's going on with the drop boxes. Well, if there's no cameras around, uh, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, right? Just saying. Just saying. I'm not telling you to break the law. Uh, what other substances should we avoid putting in the ballot drop boxes in Democrat counties this election season? <laughs> Maybe put some molasses down in there and then dump a whole nest of ants down in one of them drop boxes, man. Because they're not votes, they're ballots. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm not telling you to break the law, not saying break the law. No, 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 don't, don't go there. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't understand that Russia is a very Christian nation, and this was put out by the uh, Orthodox Katniss. Uh, the 7th of July is the day of remembrance of all Russian saints. That's today. To Russia, these are close kin by blood who have given an example in, of life in Christ. And are the glory, wealth, and jewels of the kingdom. Boy, it sounds like what the United States used to be. Or what a Christian in the United States used to be. We've lost our way. Though their labors in Russian land, they have enriched the Lord's creation and are now the inheritance of all Christians. They are alive in heaven. They answer our prayers, assist, and intervene. Demons fear them and angels glorify them. They were hermits and monks pious women and children, living in cities, princes and bishops, lay people, and I, I, I don't even know what this word is, A-S-C-E-T-I-C-S, -E -S, ascetics, blessed uh, and, and holy fools. They all appeared not by chance, but by at moments in Russian history, through their acts, they clearly show their love of God and their love for his people. Today we strive to follow their example and achieve holiness I wish we did in the United States. Uh, hey, oh, so we're going to get on another story. <laughs> I don't have a tweet about this one. But Louisiana is passing a law that they're going to castrate pedophiles uh, for um, raping uh, kids under the age of 13. So if you're a Democrat in Congress, don't go visit Louisiana because you could get castrated. Because <laughs> we know they're all satanic pedophiles. All right, let's keep going. This is Cor K. Bowles. The Nazi menace is rising again in Europe. The engine of Hitler's Nazi ideology, Germany, looks the other way. Dangerous times ahead. Holocaust, Holocaust in Ukraine. On the Ethiopian island of Saranima, 
They are removing the tomb. Yeah, I've read about this. They're removing the tombstones of Red Army soldiers. By the way, if you didn't understand in World War II, the Red Army defeated Nazi Germany. It wasn't the, the Allies. Okay, I mean, the Allies played a role, but I mean, Russia was much more involved in, the, in defeating Nazi Germany. And they're actually removing the tombstones of Red Army soldiers who defeated fascism in that country. Read that again. They are removing the tombstones and dismantling the graves. They're actually digging up the freaking graves. What the freak is wrong with the West? That's why I posted at the beginning of the video the, the idiocy, the lunacy. We've got lunatics in charge of the West. Of course, we've got a senile old man, which I told you he's going to be going away soon, but God knows what he's going to take place. So this is more on the Turkey thing, and this is from Douglas McGregor. Russia is helping Turkey to build a supply chain for nuclear materials that could clearly be used for warhead production. Uh, Israeli actions are accelerating this process. Washington can't stop this development. So yeah, it's, uh, so America tries to stop the construction of a nuclear power plant. By the way, the app, what is it? What's that nuclear power plant in, uh, in, in um, the Aparosia? The Zaporosia. The Zaporosia power plant has come under attack by the Ukrainians again in Russia. And uh, Jason Hinkle, he's put together a video on that. I, I, I encourage you to follow him. He's over in Russia right now. I don't know if he's going to move there. He might just move there for his residence. But anyway, uh, but I mean, they keep attacking the nuclear power plant. Why on earth would the Ukrainians attack a nuclear power plant? Even the Russians are not stupid enough to attack a nuclear power plant. I mean, you know what they're trying to do. They're trying to get us into a freaking nuclear war. So I'll put this video up. Israeli soldier. This this is. It's actually kind of funny. Israeli Israeli soldiers attack an elderly Palestinian woman in Jerusalem. So they're they're moving along with their guns, and this woman comes out. Man, they punched her right <laughs> right in the face. You know what? Rather than make a video, I just got to show this to you. I put the dog down here. You got to see this. Let's let's bring up the video. Boom! <laughs> Just, I shouldn't laugh. It's, still, it's so depressing. Uh, okay. Real Robert. And here is others. Right. Wisconsin. Well, we already talked about this in a previous video, but I thought that I would read this to you. So Wisconsin fired. Wisconsin Election Commission Executive Director printed 64,000 ballots on the 4th Sixth floor of the Milwaukee City Hall, all in favor of, of Joe Biden. Fired. Kari Woodhall Vogue. I would say that, uh, as a reminder, that this is a felony and it is voter fraud to abuse the system. That's why the Wisconsin Liberal S Supreme Court reinstated ballot drop boxes so that felons could abuse the system. So, yeah, we saw, th we see the fraud. It was evident. And in fact, these people actually had faced some consequences for their election fraud in 2020. But now the liberal Wisconsin Supreme Court is going to enable this activity to take place again in 2024. So anyway, Lord Bebo, four Ukrainian soldiers swarm across the Dnieper on homemade raft made of plastic bottles and surrendered to the Russian army in the Kassan region. And it's just a video about that. It's hard to see. It's kind of kind of dark. Uh, the Russians are there. They're, they're accepting their surrender as they come out of the water. Um, so, yeah, I tell you what, I'd be doing the same damn thing. <laughs> I mean, if I was constricted off a street in Ukraine like the Ukrainians are and forced to fight the Russians, if I had an opportunity, I'd build me a freaking water bottle raft. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is uh, Simplicius the Thinker. Crawler under control. Quite a practical thing. It, oh, this is pretty cool, man. Uh, you know what, I'll, I'll cut this video out and make it better. Uh, but anyway, the, um, the, so it's a, it's a little robot. Uh, can you imagine, remember, the, the, like if you've got a vacuum cleaner that kind of rolls around on the floor, this is kind of the same thing. So it's quite a practical thing. It, it's easily and naturally transports cargo to soldiers in position. It's also possible to transport ammunition and medicine to points under fire. The profile of the cart, it's just a little teeny cart. I mean, it's a little robot. And it can slip through unnoticed uh, if, through bare forest belts. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that video in, the, in my video. So it's, it's pretty cool. All right. Uh, this, is the, this is a channel you definitely need to follow on uh, X. The Kobasi, 
K-O-B-E-I-S-S-I -S -S -I letter. This is absolutely insane. Annual U.S. government spending reached a massive $6.5 trillion in May, just $1.1 trillion below the March 2021 record. The government totally outlays have doubled in the past in just a decade. To put this in perspective, this is more than the size of most world economies except the United States and China. Meanwhile, the U.S. budget deficit is $1.7 trillion, or 6.2% of the GDP over the last 12 months. In the past, such levels of spending have only occurred during major crisis. What's the long-term plan here? <laughs> what a long-term plan is the bankruptcy of the United States. I can tell you that right now. All right, so we're just going to do one more. The video is getting a little long in the tooth. I got to go, believe me. It, it takes me a long time, but it's a, it's a work of pleasure. I don't make any money off of this stuff. Uh, while the genocide of Ukrainians is going on at the front and rear, Zelensky and his gang have legalized the purchase of agricultural land in Ukraine by foreigners. At the moment, only three companies have already bought up 17 million hectare acres of agricultural land. This is slightly less than half the agricultural land, 42.7 million hectare acres. The former prime minister of Ukraine, Yulia, boy, I can't pronounce this, Tomaskienko, makes a fiery speech on the video. Ah, let's maybe go one more. Uh, well, this is, this is pretty cool. So this is uh, Mario Knopfel. Nuke sub in U.S. doomsday plane pops up near Russia. A U.S. nuclear submarine popped up in the Norwegian Sea in a show of force. It can carry up to 20 nuclear weapons and is traveling with an E-68 Mercury, a.k.a. doomsday plane, which handles nuclear command and control for the president. So, I tell you, we are, we are pushing the button, man. We're getting closer and closer to nuclear war. Peace out. Stay free. Вот такая у нас доставка. Батарейка новая. Без нее мы столько не проедем, сколько надо. На полпути кончится. Будем надеяться, с этой будет все шикарненько. Смотрите, у нас тут пейзажики красивые. Установка тут железка. Электрички не дождались, короче, пешком пошли. А так нормально все. С собачонкой. С собачонкой полегче. Лаги у нас тут. Опа. Ребята мчатся. Колесо пробили. Такое тут, такое, ну так себе, конечно, поездки, страшно, так что нормально все, работаем, пойдет.